Sehr geehrter Herr Bundestagspräsident Lammert, sehr geehrter Herr Vorsitzender, lieber Hans-Gerd äh, Pöttering, sehr geehrter Herr Vorsitzender Berg, sehr geehrter Herr Vorsitzender Hassemer, sehr geehrter Damen und Herren. <lacht> It's more comfortable for you if I now switch to English. <laughs> I'd like to thank the creators of the Berliner Europa Rede, the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, the Robert Bosch Stiftung and the Stiftung Zukunft Berlin for this invitation to speak to you today. I thank you, but I also congratulate you for choosing this date, 9th of November. With the establishment of the Berliner Europa Rede, you have not only created a new European public space, by placing it every year on this day, a German and a European Schicksalstag, you expressed a strong link between the destiny of Germany and the destiny of Europe. This date reminds us of both painful and joyful moments of the recent history of your country and with it of our continent. It is the day when the German Kaiserreich came to an end. Two days later, the First World War armistice brought insufferable carnage to an end but failed to pave the way for enduring peace. It is the day of the Nazis burning of the synagogues in 1938, one of the events that announced horrors yet to come. But then, it is the day of the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, when freedom prevailed over totalitarian rule. This date symbolizes the fact that our actions have consequences, that political decisions are not indifferent, that history is shaped not by fatality, but by what we do or we don't do. That by taking the right decisions, we can build hope, humanity, and freedom. I remember clearly the 9th of November, 89. At that time, I was deputy foreign minister of my country. I was following with attention the developments here in Germany. I was following these events here from the southwestern tip of our continent. Yet things felt so close. Emotions were so strong. It reminded me very much of the celebrations in the streets when Portugal won its democracy in 74. When you are 18 years of age and you see a regime, a dictatorship fall in one day, you will never forget what democracy means. I instinctively, I instinctively believed that something extraordinary was happening, that the opening of the Berlin Wall meant the reunification, not only of Germany, but also of Europe. That is why I am really so honored to be here today in this country and in this city, just a few meters from where the destiny of Europe changed to talk to you about the challenge Europe faces today. And once again, my apologies for arriving late. Usually, hans Gert Petrie knows that I'm very punctual, but I could not control the fog in Berlin that delayed all the planes came from the other parts of Europe. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Europe is indeed very different today to how it was in 89. Not only the European Union growing from 12 member states, we were then, to 27 member states, 
having today a truly continental dimension and a global outreach. But we are also different in the world because the forces of globalization combined with information technology have resulted in a new, completely new dimension of interdependence that affects every European country and every European citizen. In 1989, the internet was not yet part of our daily realities. Markets were not in a position to trigger, within seconds, chain reactions to events that spilled all around the globe. And this is our reality today. This is the reality that informs our policy and shapes our political challenge. This reality sits alongside the emergence, the rapid development of many economies and nations whose influence on world affairs was much more limited than it is today. The bipolar system of the world before 89 has been replaced by a multipolar, more unstable, more unpredictable world. And if Europe wants to play its role in this new world, our member states must realize that they do not have the power or influence to do so alone. Already in 1954, Jean Monnet predicted that, and I quote Jean Monnet, our countries have become too small for today's world when compared to the potential of modern technical means and in relation to the dimension of America and Russia today, China and India tomorrow. Jean Monnet, 1954. Over half, over half a century later, Europe's challenges are even greater. And so our ambition must be stronger, not weaker. More or less at the same time, Konrad Adenauer defined the task of generations to come in four simple words. Europe muss geschaffen werden. So I think we can say that the generations that have preceded us have done their part. Now is the time for us to do ours. Only United Europe has the leverage and strength to defend our values and promote our interests in the world. And let's be clear, those values and interests must be promoted. I know that in the current uh, tendency towards negativism, something I often call the, the intellectual glamour of pessimism, uh, people tend to underline Europe's problems. Every commentator wants to show that he's more intelligent than the others being more pessimistic. Yes, it is clear that we are facing difficulties and serious difficulties. But we must not diminish the fact that since the Second World War, and in large part thanks to the development of European integration, we have established in this continent, here in our Europe, the most decent societies known to mankind. In no other place on earth has it been possible to put together this combination of civic, political, and economic freedoms, the equality of rights between men and women, the respect for the environment, the ambition for higher levels of social cohesion and social protection, the solidarity with other parts of the world less fortunate than ourselves. In other words, also what was created here in Germany, and it is now part of our model in Europe, and it is in the Lisbon Treaty, the social market economy that we have consolidated through the process of integration. A model that is based on values with a transformational and inspirational power. A model that is indeed an inspiration for many other parts of the world. So we can be proud of our model. It is left to be defended and developed. But to do so, we must ensure us Europe continued prosperity. And for that, we must make ourselves more competitive. We need a greater degree of economic discipline and convergence. And we need to match our monetary union with an economic union. In other words, in the globalization age, the unification of Europe is more essential than ever if we want to preserve our way of life, to protect our values, 
to promote the prosperity of our citizens. And by acting together, we can gather strengths through numbers. We can create a truly European dimension. This is not detrimental to member states, as sometimes is said in some debates, putting the European Union in opposition to the interests of our democratic countries. Rather, I believe it is in their interests. Germany, for instance, counts more in the world today, not only because of its economic power, the force of its um, industry, of its exports, of its technology, the great democracy you have established here, your culture. Germany counts also more in the world because it is a real force in Europe. And this is why we can, at the same time, reinforce what is so important for us, the European dimension and also our national interests inside this European dimension. So Europe is our destiny. Strength through unity is our fate. That is why we must stand together and forge a stable union, a deeper union, a stronger union. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the case for Europe, I believe, is a dynamic one. Europe is not a concept that can be finished once and for all. It is a concept that must be and that can be adapted to changing circumstances, politically and economically. Talk of emerging powers has become now commonplace. Let me say this. Provided there is a political will, the greatest emerging power in the world will be the European Union. In reality, if you compare the European Union today, I'm not now speaking about the power of Europe in the past, the power of the different politica, political empires that Europe created, or the power of different nations in the world. But if you compare the European Union today with its continental size, the European Union counts more today than the European Union of the 6, the 9, or the 12. So indeed, as a union, we are now an emerging power. The question, the important and relevant question is to see if we have the political will to deepen this union. Because the unique nature of the European Union makes it a power of transformation through cooperation, not imposition. And we have been painfully aware in recent months that our union carries imperfections that, that we must address. But I can tell you this. Our partners in the world urge us to strengthen the pro this project. They emphatically do not encourage us to abandon it or even weaken it. The world needs a stronger Europe, more Europe, not less. Yet there are some in Europe who claim that their country does not need the rest of Europe. Populism, and sometimes even nationalism, raises its head across our continent, claiming that too much Europe is the cause of our current difficulties, claiming that less Europe or even non-Europe would bring solutions. This is ignoring the global realities as well as our common history that teaches us that this continent is simply too small and too interdependent for us to stand apart to turn our backs to each other. There cannot be long-term peace and prosperity in the north or in the west of Europe if there is no peace and prosperity in the south or in the east. But the argument for going it alone also defies economic rationality. Just an example. In 2010, Germany exported more goods and services to the Netherlands, around 15 million inhabitants, than to China, to France, than to the United States, to Poland, than to Russia, to Spain, than to Brazil, to Hungary, than to India. Germany exported almost five times as many goods to the rest of the European Union than it did to the BRICS countries altogether, China, India, Russia, Brazil, all of them. Its imports from the BRIC countries stood at just 20% of those from its European Union neighbors. And I could continue with many other examples that show how deep is our integration and our interdependence. Were the euro area or the European Union to break apart, the costs have been estimated by some 
at up to 50% of GDP in an initial phase. And it is estimated that the German GDP would contract by 3% and it would lose 1 million jobs if the euro area were to shrink to a few core member countries. This study made by a very important financial institution here in Germany. What is more, it will jeopardize the future prosperity of next generation. That is a threat that hangs over us. And it is that threat that guides our commitment to resolving the situations in Greece and elsewhere, provided that those countries play their part as well. That is why all responsible leaders must now make the case for Europe. Make the case for strength through unity. We must engage our citizens in an honest and frank debate about Europe, about its assets, but also about its shortcomings, about its potential and its future. We must show our citizens what is at stake. We must choose the path of strength over weakness, unity over fragmentation, the hard choice over the easy one. To do otherwise will be to consign ourselves to what Paddy Ashton stated recently, and I quote, a collection of perfectly sovereign corks bobbing along in the wake of other people's ocean liners. Ladies and gentlemen, the European Union does not promise paradise, but it is indeed our best chance for prosperity. It is institutionally and politically in international relations the single greatest achievement of our time, probably also of human history, when you think what was the past of war and conflict, not only in Europe, but in so many parts of the world. Our best means to use the crisis as an opportunity for creativity out of destruction. This is the European Union. The European Union was created precisely for moments like the ones we have now. It is in the moments of difficulty that we can see those who are really ready to defend the European Union as a project. What we need is Europeans for all seasons, not only when things are easy. It is precisely in moments of difficulty that we have to show our commitment to Europe. And of course, I hope that we will stand collectively behind it and give it the tools it needs to make Europe stronger. Let me be clear, that is not about power grabbing. Very often, our discussions are dominated by this paradigm. Of course, as president of the European Commission, people would expect me to argue for a European approach. But as I say very often to my interlocutors, I'm not here as a trade union for the European Commission. After more than 30 years in politics, in my parliament, in my country, but also in the government, 12 years in the government, also as foreign minister and prime minister, and now after seven years in the commission, I want to tell you that I have never seen politically anything so clearly as the need for a stronger Europe. We are witnessing now fundamental changes to the economic and geopolitical order that convince me that Europe needs to advance now together or risk fragmentation. We are in one of those moments where we cannot stand still. There are some moments when we can keep business as usual. But now the dynamics of globalization in financial, economic terms, but also geopolitical terms, put the Europeans in front of a choice. Do they really want to live together and to share a common destiny and count in the world? Or do they really want to face the prospects of fragmentation and decline. So Europe must either transform itself or it will decline. We are in one of those defining moments where we either unite or face irrelevance. If I may use a Latin expression, we are in one of those moments where non progredi est regredi. Ladies and gentlemen, Europe is indeed at crossroads. That is why it is so vitally important now to ensure that we get it right. That we build the kind of Europe we want and we need for the future. To give it the tools to make it strong. To use the current crisis 
as an opportunity to modernize and dynamize Europe and how it is run. Our goal must not be to restore the statu quo ante, but to move on to something new and better. For that to happen, we need a stability union, but also a solidarity union. To get the growth that Europe so badly needs for any of these to survive, we need more discipline, but also more convergence. We need a union of responsibility, but also a union of solidarity. If we agree that we share a common destiny, these all belong together. Reinforced governance of the euro area must be a central pillar of this, and is the focus of my intervention today. But this should not detract from the importance of strengthening the European integration in other areas, namely common foreign and security policy and defense. Europe can only count in the world if it is strong and united around an active promotion of its values and interests. And let's not be naive. Without a political dimension, without a diplomatic dimension, and without also the capacity to project power, we will not be up to the challenges of today's and future world. But today, let's just focus on strengthening our method for economic governance. It is clear that markets make decisions that can affect us all within seconds. In response, we cannot continue to take decisions as we have been doing until now. The speed of the European Union and a fortiori of the euro area cannot be the speed of its slowest member or its most reluctant member. There are, and must be, indeed there are, safeguards for those who do not want to go along. But it is one thing not to go along, another thing entirely to hinder others to move forward. Neither should Europe veer backwards to the kind of developments that would run it through intergovernmental cooperation alone. That will take us back to the 19th century, not even to the 20th century, but to the 19th century, where peace and prosperity were supposed to be guaranteed through a precarious balance between a limited number of powers, great powers, medium powers, small powers in Europe. We know very well that this kind of balance of powers did not work then. That is why after the Second World War, we created common supranational institutions and methods. Jean Monnet once wrote that, and I'm quoting, nothing is possible without man, and nothing is lasting without institutions. Legitimate institutions, <laughs> created and upheld by the member states, must have a strong role in the governance of the union system. They are the only entities mandated and instructed to act in the interest of all member states. And they are the gardens of transparency, of fairness, and of democracy in the Union. In the European Union, we have institutions where the member states are represented, namely the European Council and the Council. But we also have institutions of an innovative supranational nature, the democratically elected European Parliament, the European Commission, the European Court of Justice, the European Central Bank, the Court of Auditors. It is precisely these supranational institutions that are the best guarantee for the respect of the agreed principles and rules in a union of sovereign states. Because the sovereign states entrust institutions with certain powers, but also with the mandate to uphold the best interest of all its members, bigger or smaller. It is precisely these supranational institutions that have the independence and objectivity to ensure that all member states, those in the euro area and those outside, are treated equally before the treaties. It is precisely these institutions that are entrusted to, make, to take some decisions outside the realm of political bargaining, thus ensuring that financial stability cannot be held hostage to politics. This is the meaning of the role of the Commission as economic government of the European Union in the fields of the union competences. This is the reason why we have decided to create an independent European Central Bank. At a time when Europe is completing its monetary union with an economic union, and at a time when convergence and discipline are increasing, the independent and objective role of the institutions is more necessary than ever. It is in this perspective that in the upcoming discussions regarding the deepening of European integration, including 
through possible changes to the European Union treaties, the Commission will steadfastly uphold its role as guarantor of the European common good, the general interests of Europe, including, of course, the interests of all our member states, and will defend the integrity of the single market and the integrity of the single currency. The European Union as a whole and the euro area belong together and should not be divided. The Commission welcomes and urges, in fact, we have been asking it for a long time, a deeper integration of policies and governance within the euro area. Such integration and convergence is the only way to enhance discipline and stability and to secure the future sustainability of the euro. In other words, we have to finish the unfinished business of Maastricht, to complete the monetary union with a truly economic union. But stability and discipline must also go together with growth. And the single market is our greatest asset to foster growth. Let me be clear, a split union will not work. This is true for a union with different parts engaged in contradictory objectives. A union with an integrated core but a disengaged periphery a union dominated by an unhealthy balance of power, or indeed any kind of directorium. All these are unsustainable and will not work in the long term because they will put in question a fundamental, I would say, a sacred principle, the principle of justice, the principle of the respect of the equality, the principle of the respect of the rule of law. And we are a union based in the rule of law and not in any rapport of forces. It will be absurd if the very core of our project and economic and monetary union as embodied in the euro area, this is the core of our project. So I say it will be absurd that this core were treated as a kind of opt-out from the European Union as a whole. No, the euro area is not an opt-out from the European Union. In fact, all the European Union should have the euro as its currency. So the challenge is how to further deepen euro area integration without creating divisions with those that are not yet in it. Let us recall that whilst two member states, only two member states, negotiated an opt-out from the monetary union, the treaties foresee accession to the euro area both as an obligation and as a right for all others, provided that the conditions are met, of course, and that requires strict verification, stricter than in the past. But to create the idea now that we have two unions in Europe means disunion, <laughs> means, in fact, a separation of the members of the euro area from the others that are not yet members of the euro area. Let's take a country like Poland. They've already stated very clearly that they want to join the euro as soon as all the criteria are met. So why should we now put more conditions for the countries that want to be in the core of the European project feel they are left some time behind? I don't think it is fair for those countries. So let us be clear. The treaties do not define the euro area as something that is distinct from the European Union. The treaties define the euro area as the core of the European Union. Belonging to the euro area or striving into the euro area should constitute European Union normality. Not belonging to it is a derogation from the rule. It would be absurd if the part of our integration that is deepest on the substance would be the lightest on the form. The difficulties we face today have not been caused by the respect of the community method, but rather by the lack of respect for it. The truth is that economic and monetary union is ultimately incompatible with the logic of pure intergovernmentalism. Because economic and monetary union requires commitments, rules, and respect of commitments, and rules going beyond mere peer pressure or mere cooperation among governments.
And those rules cannot be subject to the unstable logic of political influence or maneuvering, of diplomatic negotiation, or of backroom bargaining. And this means that the deepening of the euro area integration, including by treaty change, must preserve the European Union's political, legal, and institutional coherence. This means that the deepening of the euro area integration must be done through the community method, preserving and developing the role of the community institutions. But already, in the terms of the current, current treaty, the European Union can go further in this direction. And this direction is indeed necessary. Before the end of this month, the Commission will come forward with a package of further measures to deepen European Union and euro area economic convergence, governance. This will include the following five elements. First, a co-decision regulation linking EFSF and ESM assistance with country surveillance on the basis of Article 136 of the treaty. By placing the governance of the euro area within the overall treaty framework, and thereby in the community method, this would ensure the legal and institutional coherence and the compatibility between the euro area and the European Union as a whole. This regulation will, on the one hand, provide an interface between financial assistance under the EFSF and the future ESM, the nature of which, as you know, is intergovernmental, and also treaty-based surveillance on the other. It will step up surveillance for Euro member states receiving precautionary assistance and assistance under an adjustment program, and will also ensure post-program surveillance. Second, we are going to present a further co-decision regulation on deeper fiscal surveillance also on the basis of Article 136 of the treaty. For euro area member states in excessive deficit procedure, it will set out graduated steps and conditions for monitoring national budgetary policies. It should enable the Commission and the Council to examine national draft budgets ex ante and to adopt an opinion on them before adoption by the national parliaments requesting a second reading in serious cases. In addition, the Commission will monitor budget execution and, if necessary, suggest amendments in the course of the year. Thirdly, we'll present a communication on the external representation of the euro on the basis of Article 138 of the treaty. The crisis continues to show that the euro area needs to speak with one voice in international institutions and fora. We otherwise risk diluting our messages and our credibility. The more we improve our internal euro area economic governance, the more pressing is also the need for a strong and efficient external representation of the euro area. Does anyone know that, for instance, the euro area member states taken together are the biggest contributor to the IMF? Most people don't know that, precisely because we do not appear as the euro. We appear as different member states in different constituencies. That's why the Commission will make proposals towards a more consolidated European voice and representation in international fora and institutions such as the IMF. Fourthly, we will present, I know this is controversial, but I want to tell you, we will present a green paper on euro stability bonds. As I said in my State of the Union speech in the Parliament on the 28th of September, once the euro area is fully equipped with the instruments necessary to ensure both integration and discipline, the issuance of joint debt will be seen as a natural and adventurous step for all, on condition that such euro bonds will be stability bonds, bonds that are designed in a way that rewards those who play by the rules and deters those who don't. Our green paper on euro stability bonds will present the options for the joint issuance of bonds in the euro area together with further steps of reinforced economic governance options that will need to be developed depending precisely on the different options. Some of them can be implemented within the current treaty, whereas fully-fledged euro bonds would, of course, require treaty change. The fifth and last element of our economic governance package will be the 2012 Annual Growth Survey. Against the backdrop of a waning economic recovery in Europe, the annual growth survey will set out the priorities for policies towards more growth and jobs in the European Union. It is also the starting point 
for the second European semester, which is our framework for monitoring and coordinating fiscal and economic policies at European level. The annual growth survey will assess progress in implementation of national commitments during this year in the framework of country-specific recommendations and under the Europlus Pact and help with the preparation of next year's economic policies. In addition to these upcoming initiatives, I'm sorry they are rather technical, but they are extremely important if you really want to have convergence and discipline in the euro area. In addition to these upcoming initiatives, I announced just some days ago that I had decided to entrust Commissioner Oli Rehn with a reinforced status as Commission Vice President for Economic and Monetary Affairs and for the euro. Having a commissioner especially dedicated to the euro shows our determination to have, to have euro governance take place inside the community institutions and in respect of the community methods. The political and symbolic importance of this measure could not be clearer and is furthermore underpinned by internal commission arrangements which will reinforce the structural guarantees of fully independent and objective decision making. Let me tell you very frankly, ladies and gentlemen, after seven years now in Brussels and in the Commission, that one thing we don't need in Europe is more institutions and more agencies and more entities to manage the euro. We don't need more. <laughs> one of the problems we have sometimes, also in terms of communication, is very complex, and not only complex, complicated system. If we are not happy with the way this institution or that institution works, we have to correct it. We have means to do it. Using precise institutional framework, we have the European Parliament that is directly elected. But the idea that we solve problems, creating every time a new institution, it's only an idea to make things more opaque, more time consuming, less coherent, and less readable for the common citizens. And precisely, we want to make our Europe better understood also from our citizens and also from the rest of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, deepening convergence and integration of the European Union must also involve deeper democracy. And I know the debate that is taking place here in Germany. I'm afraid I could not listen to all the comments by uh, President Lammert, but I'm sure that I would have agreed with everything he said. <laughs> democracy, I'm, I'm sure, yes, because we share the same values for democracy and for Europe. I think democracy must be deepened at national level, but also at European level. And this is indeed an extremely challenging task. Let me tell you that to have a democracy at European level, it is indeed very complex, but I'm sure that you and also you, President Lambert, will agree that even at national level, consolidate democracy, it is sometimes not without difficulties. I believe that European democracy must be furthered by enhancing the relationship between national democratic processes and the European democratic process. This will be the best way to involve our citizens in the decisions we take. The community approach will continue to be essential in this by ensuring the principle of subsidiarity, that is a democratic principle. Our union is, and will remain for the time to come, a creation sui generis. Its constitution and its action cannot be measured by the criteria of the nation state. And it cannot be measured by the criteria of an international organization. The European Union is a new creation for a new reality. This means that we cannot, as it sometimes done, that is done, oppose the national democratic processes to the European democratic process. We cannot substitute national democracies with the European democratic process, nor can we replace the European democratic process with the national ones. We need both for the Union to work in a way that is seen as a legitimate way by our citizens. This is the essence of the community method, of the Gemeinschaftsmethode. In the domain of the judiciary, your Bundesverfassungsgericht has found a good term to describe the coexistence of the national judiciary with the European judiciary. They call it a cooperative relation, a cooperation Verhältnis. I think that is well worth reflecting on the transposition, mutatis mutandis, of course, of this idea 
to the relationship between the national and European legislatives. Both have their spheres in which they are irreplaceable. I repeat, irreplaceable. Neither can substitute the other. Both the national democracy and European democracy have to respect each other. It is well worth investing into such a cooperationsverhältnis rather than postulating a competitive relation, a concurrenceverhältnis. I emphatically disagree with the assertion that democracy is only possible within the limits of a nation state. I know that some people think like that. They are completely wrong. They have not yet understood that they are living in the 21st century, a world of globalization. <laughs> globalization and the crisis we are going through shows us the limits of democracy if it is confined to the nation state. Of course. Our first political community of reference, at least for most of us, is our country. This is normal. But to think that we can only solve the difficult issues we have at stake through democracy in our country and not to accept the principles of democracy for the wider Europe, it will be really a mistake. Because it will mean that we will not use the tools of democracy to solve questions at our European dimension. If we want to preserve democracy also for the global order, we need to complement the democracy of the nation state with democracy in the European Union. Otherwise, we will hand over material sovereignty, the real sovereignty, to the markets. It will no longer be the sovereignty of our member states. It will be the sovereignty of the markets, the sovereignty of financial speculators, the sovereignty of global operators, not subject to any kind of democratic scrutiny. That is why we need strong European democracy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, over the last months, Germany has been called to demonstrate this drive for Europe more than ever before, and perhaps more than any other country in the European Union. In the face of tremendous pressure and sometimes criticism, Germany must take its responsibilities seriously. Yet, such responsibility can be a heavy weight. It can divide opinion, especially when Germany must also bear this weight for a long period of time. The path towards a more prosperous and sustainable Europe, let's be honest, is far from over. I've been using, it was a coincidence, a Greek expression. This is not a sprint, it is a marathon. It is a marathon. We have to be prepared for a marathon to test our resilience, our commitment. There will be no miracles, no silver bullet solutions. So, just as the founding fathers of Europe had a vision after the two devastating world wars for our continent, we must also now act with resilience and with vision towards a Europe that is strong and open, that is prosperous and sustainable, and that continues to offer our citizens peace, prosperity, and opportunities for generations to come. Now is Germany's time to show that it is fighting the cause of a strong, integrated, competitive, united Europe. Now is Germany's time to uphold the principles that underpin the European Union, and most especially the democratic legitimacy and transparency that come from the community approach. Over the last 18 months, the European Union, and in particular the Economic and Monetary Union, has started to undergo a process of wholesale renovation. We have made mistakes, but we are not staying where we were. Germany is making a very, very important contribution in terms of the financial guarantees that it's giving. So let me say it in German. Ich möchte Deutschland und den Deutschen für ihren großen Einsatz für unsere Europa von Herzen danken. Along the European history, the European integration history, Germany has been the biggest contributor in financial terms to our project. That's why I never miss an opportunity to say thank you. Yet, let's be completely frank, there is a paradox. 
the perception of the outside world is not always in tune with this. And this is something that I think very often, because when I see the debate here in Germany, and I compare the debate in Germany with other countries, I see that the perceptions sometimes are almost the opposite. Perceptions and misperceptions. So we should ask why? Why this happens? Why Germany, that has been giving the biggest financial contribution to this, the response to this crisis, is not always perceived as doing precisely that. If I may offer a thought on this, it is the following. In politics, the issue is sometimes not what we do, but how we do it. It is about explaining and communicating what we truly believe to be in the best interest of our citizens. This is why the agenda for Europe must be a positive one. It must be about aiming for a higher goal. The agenda for Europe must not be a reluctant intervention to avoid the worst, but an enthusiastic plan to create the best. It must be an agenda based on the idea of the common good. Four years ago, the heads of state and government of the European Union, the president of the European Parliament, then my dear friend Hans-Gerd Pöttering, who is hosting us tonight, Chancellor Merkel, as a president of the European Council, and myself for the European Commission, we have signed right here in Berlin, precisely the Berlin Declaration, on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the Treaty of Rome. Following the negative vote on the Constitutional Treaty, I had proposed this declaration as a way of creating a new consensus for a way forward among member states. You remember that at that time, some member states were saying that they did not want a new treaty. They were opposing any kind of revision of the treaties. And it was possible to have a new start a new consensus. And the Berlin Declaration stated a simple yet fantastic truth. Wir sind zu unserem Glück vereint. Zu unserem Glück, das ist wahr. An einem Tag wie dem 9. November ist uns das unmittelbar verständlich. Aber es ist nicht nur am 9. November wahr. Es muss unsere Inspiration für jeden Tag, für unseren Alltag sein. Wir sind zu unserem Glück vereint. This is a precious gift, one that we must cherish and preserve. And that requires more than just duty and skill. It requires reason and passion. It requires commitment and, yes, enthusiasm. As we move forward, as Europe continues to shout its way out of the crisis, my appeal to Germany is this one. To show leadership in partnership. To show leadership in the community spirit. I know that some of the choices we ask our citizens to make are not at all easy. But if we want the euro to survive, and if we want Europe to thrive, they are necessary. And leadership is about making possible what is necessary. To do so in the knowledge and certainty that the actions we take today to transform Europe are the guarantees of peace and prosperity for future generations. Because none of what we have achieved is irrevocable. Everything can be taken away much more rapidly than it was built. The crisis, ladies and gentlemen, is far from over. But we have the resources, we have the means, if only we have the spirit and the will. So let us not look at the challenge before us with a faint heart, but with commitment and conviction. Conviction for a Europe that is prosperous, that is open, that is strong, that shapes global governance in line with European values. And I underline the word values. Values of responsibility, of solidarity, of democracy. If we want Europe to go on being a beacon of hope to people in other parts of the world, we must not let its scandal go out. We must be inspired by the soul of Europe. We must breath life into it again. A breath of hope and of confidence, as is so exemplarily embodied in our European anthem, Friedrich Schiller's Hode and die Freude. Let me tell you that in the recent debate about the euro, sometimes I feel very, very uncomfortable. Some days ago I was, together with others, in the G20 in Cannes. 
where the discussion about the global economy was more a discussion about the problems of the euro area. One thing I said to myself when I was listening to all the leaders of the rest of the world telling Europe to do what to do, that is much easier to solve the problem of the others than our own problems. <laughs> and, uh, of course, one thing we have learned in Europe through the history, and we are a very old continent, a very old civilization, is that arrogance is the worst form of stupidity. And that's why we listen humbly all the advice. But at the same time that we listen all the advice, and most of the advice was very good advice, I have to say, I was saying to myself the following. Yes, we can listen to the advice of others, but there are some things we don't want to change in Europe. We don't want to apologize because you are democracies. We prefer it to be democracy. We prefer to take more time in our decisions than to be a dictatorship that imposes decisions in its citizens. Yes, we don't have to apologize because we are a social market economy. Because we believe that if someone is poor, it is not necessarily because it's his fault. Because we believe that we should help those who are left behind. So yes, we have to correct what is not going well in Europe. And there are many things that are not going well. But at the same time, I hope that all of us in Europe are able to show the dignity of being Europeans. Some pride to be Europeans, not arrogance, but pride to defend our model, to say this is the Europe we want and we are ready to defend. And while we accept the lessons of others, we are able also to propose our advice for the rest of the world. So my final message, ladies and gentlemen, is the following. Let us remain loyal to the vision of the Founding Fathers. Speaking here at the invitation of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, let us not betray the legacy of Konrad Adenauer. Let us live up to their ambition by taking a federative leap forward for a deeper, stronger, united Europe. Lassen Sie uns also diese Herausforderung mit Freude angehen, damit auch die nächste Generation der Deutschen und der Europäer sagen kann, wir sind zu unserem Glück vereint. Ich danke Ihnen.